And um, so Israel was under attack for 12 days. It was very stressful days. You can see the picture up at the top. This is a, in Petah Tikva, actually the city I grew up, I just told you about. This is the first time that Petah Tikva got hit by three rockets, direct heat. So for me, growing up in Petah Tikva, we never had sirens and stuff like this because it's around Tel Aviv and usually you get it once in many years. But this time, the center of Israel was the main area for all those missiles that was, came from Hamas. Over 5,000 missiles were fired to Israel by Hamas. Hamas, just to make clear, is a terror, terrorist organization that located in Gaza Strip. This is a terrorist organization by United States, by UN, not by my definition. Hamas used Palestinian civilian as human shield and hides its ammunition in kindergarten, in hospitals, in private homes. This is a very, very um, hard situation to deal with Hamas because they're hiding behind civilians. You can look at the, you can see at the picture that down below, on one side, on the right side, when you see the straight lines, those are the missiles that came from Hamas, from Gaza Strip. If you look at the left side, the, the curly lights that you see, this is the Iron Dome, the Israeli Iron Dome. So um, the IDF, obviously, Israel Defense Forces, has to fight back in order to protect innocent Israeli um, from Hamas violence. At the picture up at the top, you can see the Iron Dome, which I told you about. This is um, a technique that Israel's developed in order to shot a missile to a missile on the way to Israel, and it's blew up in the air to control the missiles. Um, and down at the picture, you can see the IDF attacks in Gaza. This is Gaza, Gaza um, Strip. And of, obviously, um, it's, it's known for, for a lot of people, but I don't know if you know that, that service in the IDF in the Israeli army is mandatory for men and women. So I served in the IDF for five years. I was a, um, an operation officer. I served, I served in the border between Gaza and Egypt and uh, Israel, and this is a very hard and tough situation to deal with because a lot of civilians are involved, three car countries are involved, which is Egypt, Israel, and so-called Gaza or the Palestinian situation, and it's very, very complicated. Uh, I can tell that a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know have experienced this running to a bomb shelter in the middle of the night or telling their kids about their situation. And since 2014, uh, Israel was not under attack in such a size as this. So it was something that very new for a lot of people or something that Israel is not, was in a situation like this uh, um, since 2014. So it's been time, it's been seven years. Um, so what just happened? According to everything you see and whatever is going on in Israel and in Gaza, Israel faced with a lot of misinformation. You know that because you now live in the United States and you see what's going on. People base their opinion without knowing the fact. It wasn't fact-based. And it's, of course, anyone and everyone should disagree and criticize and think, you know, what they think it is should be or to have their opinion about the situation, but as long as they based on fact, because you can't get misinformation from like an Instagram post or read something on the newspaper that is basically fake news and doesn't tell the real situation, doesn't show the multiple color of it, every situation has because things are not black and white as we know. And it's very hard. And in the picture below I put Bela Hadid, Gigi Hadid. I didn't know who those models are just before the, everything's going on. And Dua Lipa is a very famous um, singer from England. But those celebrities has been using their profile, their private profile of, on Instagram and on TikTok and stuff like this to, to use and give their, their millions of followers misinformation about Israel and about the situation in Gaza and about the situation in Sheikh Jarrah. If you want me to talk a little bit about this, I can also do that. But this is something that Israel, a small country with 9 million people, has to face 
with Bella Hadid, she got 45 million people. And when she posts something and when the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs in Israel posts something, the effect and the people who can see this information isn't the same and it's really, really um, hard. I can say that in the middle of the crisis, if you check how many people hashtag on Twitter, Israel under attack, it was like um, 174K. And if you see Gaza under attack, it was 2.3 million. So obviously there are more Muslims in the world and on the media, they have, um, they control the media and it's something that uh, very, cause a lot of problems. It's leading to what we see right now on the street. Um, Jews in New York, Jews in England, you know, in England, in London, it's called the Jewish lockdown because some of people are afraid to leave their homes because what's going on on the street. We saw the march in London Street, the march in Italy, in France, in you name it, in almost every country around the world with the process that support the Palestinian, but not really. It's more of new anti-Semitic way to show the world those kind of violence, those kind of radical ideas that stand um, against Jews. You can see the swastika in the subway in New York. In the past week, attacks against Jews went up in 400%. Uh, this is insane. And it's, of course, it's, it's not really related to what happened in Israel. It is an excuse to say that what's going on between Israel and the Palestinian that obviously is a very, very complicated case and very complicated conflict that has a history of thousands of years and has many things that related to, but people using this, what they see on the media, it's, they see the IDF attack Gaza, they see all those stuff and they think this is the reality and only this is the reality and they base their opinion about this. and. I know for some of you, it might be a very hard time to leave in, in the places that you feel it's your home, but sometimes it's scary and sometimes you experience those anti-Semitic um, comments and violence and it's really, um, it's really hard. I wanna say a minute about Sheikh Jarrah. I know some people are thinking about this. So what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah and where's Sheikh Jarrah? So Sheikh Jarrah, is a neighborhood in East Jerusalem that in the past Jews used to live there. It used to be a Jewish neighborhood. You know, in the War of Independence, Jordan took over some parts of West Jerusalem, including the, the Kotel, which we know, including uh, the wall and all those area in the old city. And it used to be Jordan and some Jews family has to leave because of the war and stuff. And some Palestinians, some Arabic, some Jordanian people took over their homes. After Israel took over this land again in 1967, those neighborhood was again part of, of Israel and Israel went to those people that lived in those houses and said, it used to be Jewish homes before. Let me buy this land from you that it will be legally will be ours. In 70 years, we will see what's going on and we will have to discuss this, but let me, they make, the people who live there sign on paper to make, to make it legally as a Jewish um, homes. And now it's been dealing, it's not now, it's been 20 years, it's been dealing in the court, the Supreme Court in Israel, who should control this neighborhood? Is it the Arabs who lived there for 60 years? Is it the Jews who bought this land? Legally, it's a very complicated issues. And I don't, I don't really, as an Israeli, I don't really know the answer. It's somehow in between because what's stronger, a house that I used to live for many years or something that I bought on paper, who had to leave first, who had to leave their homes, very complicated. But this is happening in West Jerusalem that's closer to the West Bank, Hamas terror organization who control Gaza has nothing to do, nothing, not geographically, not physically, not leadership, nothing, has nothing to do with what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah. They just use this excuse to attack Israel and to open a war. They, they, 
behind their 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 uh, things they they've done, they want to show the Palestinian community or the Arab world that they support a Palestinian, or to use this as an excuse to bring up to the table so the world can see their support. And you know, Hamas has been facing um, an election soon. Don't worry, it's not going to be a democratic election. It's just going to be an election when Hamas will re-elected. How surprisingly, if it's the only party running. And um, they want to have the support of their people. And they're using Israel as an excuse. I'm back to my presentation. Again, I'm inviting you to send some question at the oh, here, chat here, if you yeah. want to ask something. If I'm speaking too much. That's his present. All right. So before I'm moving to our political situation, any question about what happened in Israel with the Hamas Israeli crisis? Any question about Sheikh Jarrah, about Gaza, about Israel, about misinformation? Before we're moving on to our next topic. All good. Speak up. Well, I have a question. Yes, please. I don't know if you're going to get to this or not, but I'm kind of curious, um, you know, with the domestic situation in the political domestic situation now after the war and, and you know, sort of the rise of, of the right wing, I mean, the far, far right, right. wing, you know, those those. I don't remember the names of the parties, but you know, the ones that are really um, attacking Arabs and are really, you know, vehemently against gay rights and they're, they just sound horrible. And, you know, it seems like they're being pulled into the government because, you know, Netanyahu needs all the support he can get. And it, do you have any sense of like, what's gonna be done about these, these, these far right people that are just, out of control and seem to be creating so much havoc within Israel itself. So I'm, I'm definitely agree with you. I'm gonna get to what's going on politically in Israel in a minute because Netanyahu is not the one who is now in charge. So it's not his turn, turn right now. So I will okay. explain about this. Okay. But, but again, the, the crisis brings a lot of extreme people up to the front and they <clears throat> using their voice and now even their voices even if they're not so many when you have a crisis you hear their voices louder and it's make you think they're everywhere yeah. and they're much influenced than they the, the power they have which is it's not right and when things are normal now when we have the ceasefire you hear them less and less mm -hmm. and when things get normal again you hear them less and less they still part of it and i will talk about the, the coalition crisis that we have in Israel and why you need them and why you have to discuss with them. But now we, we hear them less and less, which is something that I'm, I'm happy with. Okay. So I'm, okay. I'm going, I'm continuing and explaining about what's, what's going on in Israel. So, you know, I'm not proud part of this fact, but this is the fact because I told you stick to the fact Israel has four different election system in two years. This is insane, insane. And you ask yourself, how come the such and brilliant country with technology, with high tech, with everything. How come we stuck in a very stupid, excuse me about the word I'm using, in a, very, in a, in a loop? We're like an hamster running in a circle. This is so stupid. But the reason, the main reason is we never got that far. Remember, Israel is only 73 years old. My grandmother is older than this. We never got that far. So we never know we had a problem with the system. Yes, what we are experiencing right now in the last two years shows that we have problem with the system. But the thing is, in order to change the system, you had to have a government and we can't have a government. So we're sti still stuck. What happened right now that you have an election, the fourth election we had in March, after the election, the biggest leader of the biggest party, the, the leader of the biggest party, get a mandate from our president to start a form a coalition. In order to have a coalition, you have to get 61 seats, 61 Knesset member. You can see the picture down below. We have 120 seats in the Knesset, which is, is the Israel parliament. And in order to have a government, in order to have a coalition, you have to have a ma majority of 61. 
So Netanyahu is going to talk with all the, the other party leaders in order to make some um, discussion, um, negotiation with them in order to make them join him. He failed. He had a certain time for this. I think it's 28 days and he failed. What's going on that the um, president give this option to the second leader's party. So we're now in this situation. On June 2nd, on June 2nd, it will be the deadline of the second nominee to start form a coalition. So now we have a guy, Yair Lapid, he used to be a, he used to be a TV star, he used to be a TV host for many years, but he is in politics for many years. And he used to be a minister and, and played in a very important role in the Israeli government. And now he is the second leader of a, of a party that's trying to build a coalition. If he will success in, in, in a week, we will have a government without Netanyahu. Netanyahu Bibi is in control in Israel. He's the, our prime minister for more than 10 years in a row. This is another difference that we have with the United States. We don't have limitation on, of terms. Why is that? Because Bibi is in control. I believe that no one, that anyone who will elect after Bibi will make sure that we have limitation of terms. But uh, this is the situation right now. So imagine yourself that the second nominee got his mandate to start build a coalition and the, the crisis happened. The attack with Gaza happened at the same time. So all the attention went to this topic to solve this issue. So he missed some time from his time to build coalition. This is also something that we should, um, we should think about when we think about this situation. If you ask my opinion, I don't know. On one hand, I can see all those parties coming together because they haven't done this three times. So what's going to make them to do this for the fourth time? I don't know. On the other hand, I don't know what else Bibi is planning because he is so powerful and he is, you know, he's controlling a lot of government and a lot of people. So I don't know what he is having in his, you know, pocket to change the system. Worst case scenario, we're going to election for the fifth time. But let me tell you something, it will stay the same because if the same people voting for the same nominees, nothing's going to change, right? So this is something that, again, they're putting in the back of their head and it was like, we're not going, we're not wanting to go for the fifth election, so let's solve it now. But this is what they said to us and to each other at the last three times, so. Hard, confusing, and very, very sad. A lot of Israelis frustrated from this fact because remember, when you don't have a government, you don't have laws. And when you don't have laws, nothing is changed. Things in Israel are stuck for two years. Again, this is a country that whatever is decided on the government affects immediately my life. We don't have um, governors. We don't have that the cities we live in, in they have no control about our life. It's only about the state. So when you don't have this, it affects your life immediately. Coronavirus was in the, including those two years. The situation we have right now is in the two years. Many Israeli society issues between people are, are took place in those two years and you can change it. This is very, very frustrating. Um, a little update about coronavirus. So before we're moving to question, if you have any question, I want you to stay optimistic because I believe in optimism. Coronavirus, this is I'm very proud and to announce that Israel is one of the only countries in the world that almost can say clearly that we over with coronavirus. I, I wanna say it carefully, but I'm still, I'm saying this out loud. Starting from June 1st in a week, there will be no more COVID restrictions. So it's like never happened. Only 22 new cases we had in the last 24 hours, 22 people, which is nothing. And over 60% of Israel population over the age 16, obviously, received the vaccine. So you don't see in this percentage, you don't see the kids and you don't see you know, other people, but much, the majority of the population in Israel got the vaccine. 
Eh, okay, someone is calling me for three times. Okay. Um, okay, this is time for a question. If you have any question, uh, this is the time. Any question about question. anything, everything I said. I have a question. Um, yes. I thought that Benny Gantz was involved with the other party. Has, how, has he now been replaced by another individual? So it's never an individual. Our political system is only a party, but the head of the party is the one who had an opportunity to start build a coalition. But when he made an agreement with another leader of a party, it's including the entire party. So it's not about individual. So I hope you- that I'll Benny Gantz is not, is not responsible anymore for forming the new coalition. There's another person in charge. Yes, that. there's another person. It's not Benny Gantz because Benny Gantz this time broke from his um, party that he used to run with in the last election. So now he's running with, a, with his own party and they got only eight votes instead of having 24 votes. So he isn't the second biggest leader of a party. So this is why it wasn't about, it's not about him this time. They missed this opportunity. Um, yes, any more question guys? Do you think if they go into a fifth election that the voter turnout will be less because people are so disillusioned? Right, so every time we have an opportunity to check this every time and everybody's talking about this, if it's going to be a fifth election, would you vote? But Israelis are, um, hot, our percentage, I have to say this in general, our percentage of voting is very, very high. Usually in a normal life, it's around 70 something percentage, which is a lot. But because we're, we're experiencing three different elections, you can see it's getting less and less, but not in a dramatic way. So I believe that if it's going to be a fifth election, people will complain about this, people will be frustrated about this, but people will go and vote. And because they know that every vote count and every vote matter and we see what's going on. So if it's something I really, you know, I really care about, I will go and only vote. And remember, it's an uh, election day in Israel. It's a vacation day. You have no work. You can go to the beach. You just need to put a note in an envelope. So it's not something that makes people's lives harder. So we're doing their best we can to make people to vote. But please, only once in four years, not every four months. I think some someone mis misread the, the instructor of the Israel state. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, yes, please. One is, um, do you think, what, what do you think, do you think there will be any role for Ram in this election or what's going to go on with them right now? And secondly, um, who, who, I mean, I know there were two serious nominations now for president to replace Rivlin. What's the process yes. now for the president? And that election's coming. I mean, is it, do they vote or what happens to get the next president? Okay, so two great question. I will answer about the first one. So Bala, just to make people aware, Ballad is an Arabic party. We have some Arabic party. Of course, we have equal rights for Arabic. This is why Israel isn't an apartheid state, just fact base ballad is an it's considered an extreme party and uh, because there because our system it's set up that way that in this specific election they play a very important role because anyone who want, who needs to form a coalition needs them that was a fact three weeks ago a month ago what happened in that month that we faced a crisis with gaza that leads to many crises with the Arab population inside of Israel. What time so if Balad was something that all the leaders needs in order to build a coalition yeah. yesterday, Where today, many people have issues with combined to Arabs leader and their role in the big game is getting less important. Oh, wow. So now whatever goes with Gaza and Israel um, destroy their really important opportunity to be very, you know, the deal breaker. So it's not really about them. Yeah. Somehow they would like to combine them, but other parties that did not want to sit with a specific groups of parties now wants to do this because they don't want ballots to do this instead of them. So they want to make ballots to stay out. So they 
getting out of themselves in order to change it. So it did not help Balak what's going on. So I'm not really concerned about them, if I have to be honest. About your second question. So Israel has a prime minister that I just explained to you how hard it is to be a prime minister if you are elected after this long process. But we also have a president. This is more of, um, you know, just um, just a more of. Big gearhead. Yes. So uh, um, we have an election president for president every seven years, and we don't have we don't change it because it's it's a very certain system. People can nominate themselves. Anyone can nominate himself to be a president of Israel. He needs to get signs of um, politicians, politics, people in the government to support them because who, who votes for the president? It's the 100, 120 Knesset members. So now we have two nominees. One was is Itzhak Herzog. He used to be a very famous politician. Now he's ending in as the head of the Jewish agency and he is running for president. So he is a politician, um, very known. And we have a lady, her name is Miriam Peretz. She's from the people, used to be a principal for in school for many years. She's born in Morocco, made Aliyah. She is religious. She had she has few sons and, and, and um, daughters, but two of her sons are, uh, were killed in the IDF wars. So she is known because of it, because she's a very inspirational woman and she's doing a lot of education and programs and stuff mm -hmm. like this. So she became very known. So, and the people love her and support her and she represents the people. So this is one of the first time that we have someone from the people, actually from the people who has nothing to do with politics that running um, to president. So it's between those two. If she will be elected, it will, two things, two amazing things will happen. First, we will have a president, female, female president. We never had, we had a prime minister, Golda, but we never had a president. Second, we will have someone from the people and in seven years or in the future, it might change the way we see this role in general. So it might be more people from the people who run for this role. I don't know. I can, get, I can guess you can understand who I support in this, in this election, but yeah. When is the election? So the election is in the summer. So now they announced this, the, the two nominees that running, they had to get the support of, of as much as they can of uh, Knesset members. And in the summer, they will elect, and we will have a president. A, if you have more questions, this is a great time. If not, you're always welcome to um, follow up with me, to ask me questions, please. I was answering so many emails and message I got during the crisis that we have. People ask for resources and I'm happy to send some good things in English and videos. And if you want to get, if you read something that you don't understand or you want to get another opinion, so please, I'm here. This is why I'm here. I'm here for you. So please use it. I'm available in every platform. You can also call me, but I will answer in the middle of the night. So you won't do this. <laughs> Uh, that's it. So 